So, correlation. All right, so if I show you this, all right, say so a bunch of species, and I look at leaf lifespan and leaf size. What's the correlation here? No, it's 4, 4 through 5, actually. Right, so that's the R, R value. That's a pretty good correlation, negative correlation, right? Does this feel wrong to anyone? No. And also have incorrect feelings. Right, so first of all, it's biologically, like, okay, so it has this huge, really expensive leaf, and I toss it away quickly. It's a tiny little thing, I right, hold on for your life. It doesn't seem like to make a lot of sense that way, right? right what, else seems, what else is wrong about this? So one of the key learning outcomes for the core, from, from my part, is you see something that has species on it. It's like, you hear the species, you hear the species, you hear the species, whatever. You should instantly just feel this twinge of like, oh, something is wrong on the force. Boom. Yeah, exactly. Right? So, <coughs> why, do, why do we need, need to do a phylogenetic correction? What does what the sort of regression assume? Independence. Independence, right? So you can say, wow, it's so amazing that you know, so many things have evolved, you know, producing milk and having hair. Isn't it wonderful to have all this correlation of, like, look, we have, you know, 5,000 things that produce milk and have hair. What's the chance of having that happen by chance? Very small, right? So they must be correlated. It must be something about, you know, hairy milk producing. That's really good, right? Well, no, it's mammals, right? Mammals evolved hair and milk production once, right? So they have this one change. You don't have 5,000. Okay. <coughs> and so this is another case where, you know, fossil dying pops up again, right? A paper back in 85 showing that this need to correct its non-independence. And I said, okay, imagine you have this, this tree that has two clades, right? <coughs> and we have, you know, these data that are plotting. Well, right? But it could be that you have two clumps. This clump comes from this group. This clump comes from this group. Right? And it could be that you know this one increased on x, this one decreased on y. Right? So two changes only, not correlated. Different, different organisms have them. Yet because we ignored this non-dependence, we thought we had some nice little regression here. So one solution is to not do correlations between the species, right? That's kind of extreme, right? Let's figure out a solution instead. <coughs> and so the canonical solution is doing something called independent contrasts. Okay. And this what we do is rather than looking at all these pairs here, we look like all all, all you know all these different species at different points. We look at the independent change in the tree. Okay, so we compare, you know, <coughs> one contrast x1 minus x2. So this minus this. So this might go up for x and up for y. We can also compare x4 and x5, that one and that one. Okay, I can also compare this versus this. Okay, and finally this versus this. So I use every branch just once. Okay. Um, <coughs> just look at those independent pairs. Right. And so those are the contrasts. I can normalize them by expected variance. So I'm going to get a standardized contrast. That's something that has expected mean zero and variance one. Right. So you see compared V7 and V8. Well, x7, so this, this number, which is this number. So, we have, so first of all, we construct this, right? So what's, yeah, so that probably left out. So what the contrast does is, okay, I look at this change happening here to here, right? And then what I do is take the mean of these and figure out what that would be, right? And so the change is part of that. I'm just taking raw mean of this. And that's my value here. And same thing here, I take 
the wave mean of this and this? Mean start with this. The weighted mean of branch. The weighted mean of the of the tip value at V3 and the internal node value at six. Okay. So this reconstruction, like here and here, that assumes grinding motion. The variance correction assumes grinding motion. Uh, well, it assumes multivariate normal. Not so bad. Okay. Um, if you wanted to, you could just do pairs without making that assumption. You could just compare, you know, one and two is four and five, and that'd be it. Right. Um, but then three is not used at all. The range between contrast is then instead of having you know five data points, I've gone to four data points, but now they're independent. Okay. So in the era of having trees of you know ten thousand taxa. Going to 9,099 and fixing the non-dependence problem might be worth it. Right. Now a lot of people get annoyed by this because it requires you to have a tree, right? If it's doing, you know, <coughs> this raw approach here, I go out, I get a database of leaf sizes, I get a database of leaf ages, plot them all, do analysis, right? Um, to do it probably with contrast, you'd have a tree. The greatest of proportional time, which can be harder to get. Okay, but let's look back at this story. So here I see this nice little correlation. I do a tree, and by the way, this is a real life example. Okay, it's not made up. I do a tree, and here are my contrasts. See a pattern anymore? Nope. And actually, the entire this entire thing here was based on this point. Comparing to have a phylogeny, it has um, conifers here. These friends here. Uh, right, so here I have conifers and sperms, and I find that, you know, here conifers have small, long lived leaves. Right, it could be that I have small leaves, and here I have uh, general leaves. Short leaves, right? Either way, you know, that one change on those two branches is just that x. Right? But here, without the contrast, I have this whole clump of sperms that all are big leaves, but, but young, that's good, versus big cloud of conifers that have long lived small leaves. And so I'm getting the wrong answer by ignoring this contrast. When I do it properly, oh, you have no pattern. Okay. So the big moral here is anytime you you know see analysis that has just raw species values or equivalently genera or families or whatever, right? It doesn't correct for independent doesn't correct for phylogeny, you should feel deeply concerned about this. Okay. Now it's possible that some things have moved around so much that the history doesn't matter. Right? It's possible that, you know, this instrument is, is you know as likely to be similar to this you know, uh, conifer than it is to like its sister species. Right, things have changed around a lot. And so, <coughs> in last year in the core, some students in the class looked at this, and there's various tests you can do for this. They looked at this to see if that's the case for leaf nit uh, nitrogen addition, right? So maybe some things, if you add nitrogen, they do better, but sort of randomly distribute across the tree. They did a test for that. Okay. <coughs> and so there are tests you can do. But you have to do that test to know this. Right? You, so by, by default, you should think that, like, oh yeah, mammals look similar to other mammals, right? Conifers look similar to other conifers. You have to control for this non-independence, right? And it, the fact that you do, if you don't have to, that's something you need to test. First. Okay. Does that make sense? Um, if, if the true history were a star phylogeny. So if you know I have 
you know, one big mainland and this flooded, and the court has this massive outdoor appreciation event up in here. They're all equally related to each other. And so you don't have to worry about it. Okay. If I have a situation where considered burning motion has a sort of constrained process, right, where you know, expect that under burning motion, you know, if you wander around, but I expect that these two are going to be most similar to many traits in the higher business, share most of my ancestor. Right, if we evolve them within bounds, maybe it's wiggled around enough that I sort of lost that history of the, of, the, of the similarities. In that case, then you might not have to do it. Do it. But we have tests for that. And so you can test it and see, oh, there's no flagrant signal in the rock on the can It can hurt a little power. I mean, you're dropping a data point. You're making an assumption about how evolution happens. But, but you can always just test for it first. Yeah. I mean, it also hurts if you have to get a tree. Right? Um, and we talked about how you know, tree space is large and things like that. Now it's getting better, right? I mean, at this point, you know, people, people have wanted a tree of mammals for a while, so there's actually various trees of mammals you can just go and download. Right? If you're working on you know, fungi of South America, it's probably not a good tree you can download. That's that issue. So the question is do I just wait 10 years until someone makes a tree? Or do I make my own bad tree? Or do I just say, ah, you don't need a tree? Other questions about this? Okay, tree stretching. Okay, so this is Joe Felsenstein. He you know, did the independent contrast, did the bootstrapping, did some work on trees, you know, it's a hero. Right? And so on, on some rubber doll you can stretch. Okay. Um, <coughs> we're talking about a tree, stretch, tree stretching program. So, we talked about this with this multivariate normal before, right? And how do you get the covariance here? What does that mean? So, covariance between A and B, what does that mean? Nope. And it's rate times time, right? The sigma squared times time on the tree. That's so this branch length times the scaling for the rate of evolution. Okay? And so, <coughs> A and B have less covariance than D and E in this tree, right? Because you have longer time. Well, all that goes into here is this rate times time. What if I want to, well, how, how could I increase the rate on that matrix? On just, you know, how could I increase the rate on just this branch? What Increase the rate. What effect would that have on covariance? The thing that things are happening really quickly in evolutionary time during this period. I've increased your covariance. Right, increase your covariance, right? So I have. Um, let's call this right here. So I have T, you know, ABC, that branch then, times rate one. And then I have TAB. Times rate two. Right, that's my minimum covariance I have here. Right? So, what I could do is increase that covariance, increase that rate by just you know, making this twice with this. So, this was originally you know, two, and this was two. I can say make this four. Right? Is that the effect of making this less than one? Right? Um, and so, it comes into here by just making this, making this part no longer because of 4 rather than 2. Okay. And <coughs> that's a very simple way of getting at different rates by just messing with the structure. Okay. Since I know what the rates mean, right, and the covariance is just rate times time, I can treat, instead of, instead of changing the rates, I just change the time, same thing, it's a product of it. So I could modify the, by stretching the tree, it's like changing the rates. 
Okay? If this part of the tree is twice as long, stretch out twice as long, I mean, it's had twice, twice the rate there. It's half as long, they have half the rate there. Okay? So I can do that messing with the tree, plug this in, plug this in, and collect it. Okay? And so that what you're talking about, having different rates everywhere on the tree, okay? all that is with running motion, all that is is just stretching the tree in different ways. We already see this, and so that's in this case. In the discrete case, we talked about this, right? So to take, you know, figure out the probability of change, we exponentiate the rates times time. Right? What I could do is just change the times. Right? And that has the same effect as, as changing the rates. Okay? So basically, by messing with the tree branch lengths, it's equivalent to messing with the rates in the tree. So I want to make one part of the tree evolve faster under discrete or continuous models, I can just stretch that part out. That's why I call it tree stretching. Not the equivalent that it means to make the same effect. As an effect on likelihood. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If you stretch the tree time, is that what the rate? Um, if, I, if, I, if, I, if I fix the same rate everywhere, right. so like in, um, you know, here I have, you know, some sigma times time, right? I have a fixed sigma. Just stretching the time, making the time bigger, makes the amount of covariance bigger, as if I had a double doubling of the rate. Uh, neither. Sorry. Yeah. Um. All right. So. Here we so have P, A, B, C, which is this length, and P, A, B, which is this length. Okay. So, right, that's like, yeah, the angle. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> I can also have rate A, B, rate A, B, C. And so the covariance equals rate AB times time AB plus rate ABC plus time ABC. Right? Okay. Oh, sorry. Um, so this edge has length TAB. This edge has length TABC. This edge has rate RAB. This edge has rate R A B C. So in a covariance is rate times time. So rate here times this time plus rate here times this time. That's my covariance. Okay. Now <coughs> is that clear? Okay. So I want to say, all right, I think the rate here is twice as fast. That's equivalent to saying, I think, this term should be twice as big. Can you see why that's the case? Yeah? Okay. And so, so I can either change that by doubling that rate or doubling that time. It's the same effect. Right? Because the product is doubled. It doesn't matter which component I double. Right? So I redrew the tree as. This length is the same as that, this length is the same as that, and now this length is not twice as long. Right? It's equivalent to making that rate twice as big. Why is it having to just make the rate twice as big? It's, um, the way people have, have dealt with this in the past, is for historical reasons, is by the stretching of the tree. Because in, in software, it happened to be the tree was thought to be easier to modify than the rates were. So I'll use a single fixed rate and just mess with the tree, as I'm showing here. So there's no other like, There's no deep reason why. No. I mean, the advantage of doing the tree is that, you know, if you have a continuous model or a discrete model, you can just do the same messing with and affects both of them. <laughs> Yeah.
So, yeah, good question. Um, so if I think the rates are not constant through time, right, if I want to have a different rate in different parts of the tree, one way I can get at that is by doing tree stretching. And so in comparative methods, we have a whole set of approaches, you know, Pagel's lambda, Pagel's kappa, um, Lomberg's K, not Lomberg's K, uh, Lomberg's ACDC model. They're all different names, but all just different names for doing the same process of stretching certain branches in certain ways. And so, yeah, so as a uniform set of things, to call them tree stretching. It basically changes the changes the times. What was what's taken as the times. Right. Yeah. And yeah. And I mean, so intuitively it sort of makes sense to people. So if you think of something like here. So the question we students ask, you know, do you know positive signal? Does this really matter? So I said, doesn't it matter if you have a star by logic? All things equally related to each other. That's this. The original phylogeny is this. Now you're going to some sort of scaling halfway between here and here is something like this. And so this tree stretching is a way of scaling from the tree of zero to a star by logic. So I can see where that is. And so there the question is about how much phylogenetic history matters. They're just messing through this way. Um, a different approach <coughs> is delta. Right? So I can have my initial tree, and I can have change happening more early on. Right? So if I make these branches longer, we have a change happening more later, make the later branches longer. Okay. So again, it's by true stretching the tree, so you can get a feel for what's happening based on how the branches have shifted, right? Um, but we call this usually now Pagel's delta. It's a different thing. Okay. And for a while, they used different Greek letters based on whether it was continuous or discrete traits. You know, it's the same process. <laughs> Kappa. So punctuated models. So if I think that change happens only at speciation events. Right? I can imagine a case where you know, every speciation event I have, have a change, otherwise no change. There's a change happening in the time here. Right? So all of these up here under a normal clock model right, has as much time for change as Fulbinosa. I would think you know what happens at speciation events, then there's a lot more change in Fulbinosa. Okay. Let's make an assumption though. Assumption is making. Two assumptions, actually. Oh, that's really one assumption. This is assuming change happens in speciation events. I was assuming about this tree. This piece establish what? Right. I mean, that's, that's actually the, that's, well, that's, that's the hypothesis they're, they're, they're testing. Like once you have, you know, once you speciated. You're down to the next speciation event, right? Um, but could be a problem with, the, with this, tree, this tree representing that process. Why does this tree not actually show that? Does this show every speciation event in the group? Right, it only shows those species that leading to excellent species. So if I've had a whole radiation here since they're all of but they're not extinct, then this ignores that. Even worse, if I have a you know, subsample fewer there than there, it misses that. Okay? So as well, this can be problematic. Okay? And actually, we have met better methods to test this. Okay? But this basic model, though, is just, you know, again, just scaling branch lengths to get at this question. So again, you see a scale branch like this way, and I say speciation happens, change happens at speciation only. This way, you know, change happens faster or slower through time. This way, um, change is tree-like or not tree-like, right? And all these different tests for different evolutionary models are all just based on changing the tree scale. Okay. 
Um, one thing this model is sort of sold as testing, not by the author, but other people, is so it can punctuate equilibrium. Right, who's going to punctuate equilibrium? Okay, what is it? Mm-hmm. Right. So it's non constant change. And the original formulation by Gould and Eldridge thought of you know you change only at speciation events and only one of the lineages changes. Right? So okay. um, yeah, so here's their model. So rather than gradual change, you have a speciation event with like a two D plot, let's say like a three D plot. You have one lineage changing and then not changing. And no speciation event, and you have one change and then not change. Okay. It's really punctuated. And this is based on some weird ideas from Ernst Meyer about like canalization and things like that. So you had to get to a small population size and you could break out your canalization chain, otherwise you're sort of stuck. Right? And later they softened this view. But here's the original idea. And so here you should see at every species event only one of the system groups changes. Right? Whereas this model, you know, says that every species event both change. In fact, it's not equivalent. Right? Now the problem with um, <coughs> the problem with you know making a model of this is that it will basically test whether at each edge, each node, which one should be this one or this one, this one or this one, this one or this one, right? Which pretty quickly becomes a very big parameter space, right? There's two options at each node, plus the nodes, so it's two to the number of nodes, right? It's a lot of things that you should look at, okay? Um, We've done some of this in our lab, but it's not, I mean, the one really cool model isn't a very good model anymore. <coughs> and our approach is to deal with this, but they're not tree stretching. So, Fulmer Bachman has some stuff where you can sort of estimate where there was speciation in the past and see if it's related to it, and see if change related to speciation events or not. Okay? So, here you have some of them shifting through time, and the speciation events, some of them shift radically. And so it's more of the rules that's supposed to be how do you assert the rules? Nope. So the information. Is, yeah. So there's information in tree shape. You can use some information about speciation and extinction rates. Yeah. Not a ton. It's hard. But yeah, um, there's some information there. And we'll, we'll talk about that, I think, next week. You can, so, so you can infer that like the overall extinction rates and speciation rates. It's harder to infer that like right here there was a speciation event. Yeah. Yeah. There's a method to do that. Okay. And this also points out you know, when you're reading literature, all these sort of simple models, you know, like like the lambda test we're talking about, right? It's sold as one thing, but actually what it does is something a little bit different. Okay. Same way with this Ornstein Illenbeck process you're talking about. You know, papers, even our paper about it, sold it as measuring stabilizing selection. But actually, it's not quite that. It has sort of the same feel as stabilizing selection, but actually, it's a very different rate than stabilizing selection would be. Right? So, it has a sort of same, same sort of phenotype of how you sort of are pulled towards some number. It's not the same as what you measure by going out and looking at stabilizing selection. Okay? <coughs> so, when you use these methods, just be critical about what they're actually doing. Okay. Um, here's another sort of typical model, two rate model, where I can say, here's my regular original tree, and I can try having a rate speed up this in a street time after some event, before some event. Right? So pre KT, mills weren't evolving very quickly. After KT, you know, not even the answers go extinct, mills start going nuts. Right? You can test that by allowing the rate after the KT. Okay. And you know, the best model to do this right now as it's a single change, we can easily see how you could do two changes, right? Just, you know, scale this one here, this one here, and this one. So when you understand how these work, you can figure out, oh, I could make a general model for that. Okay. <coughs> Any questions on this? Okay. So a question can be addressed with tree stretching. Well, one thing is heterogeneity. This took three hours to make. <laughs> <coughs> All right, so we already talked about this. Like, 
you know, do you think there's one rate of evolution? Well, molecularly, no. Right? There's, no there's no rate of evolution from you know, treating frogs and from herbs. What about for height? Yeah, it's probably a different process for height, too. What about for flowering rate? Yeah, probably a different rate right there. And so we think that there is this different this heterogeneity. One thing we could do is try, you know, a different rate on the brown branches and the green branches. Okay. Um, <coughs> we want minimal evolution, right? Are whales in the same pressure as shrews? No. Right? Um, their body size is probably evolving in a very different process. And so, you know, maybe we don't have a different model for whales and for everything else. Okay. And so, there's another view paper sent around, right? And there's different ways of dealing with heterogeneity. Okay. And of course, the first way, and the, always the most popular, is by not. Okay. So, okay, now there might be some heterogeneity, I'll assume there's not. So I'll use the same. I can partition by character. You've already done this. Where, where did you do this already in this class? What does mean? Remember where they did this? We haven't done that much in the class so far, right? So, what? No, nope. after the midterm. It's my section. <coughs> nope. Beast. Right? When you're doing beast, when you chose gene one having one model and gene two having a different model, what were you doing there? We were saying that they have different models. Right, so that's you're done with heterogeneity there. <coughs> okay, so we do this for you know, regular trait evolution. We'll do it for like tree inference. Okay, and all these models relate between tree inference and trait evolution. Okay, and again we could do it for discrete characters or continuous characters, or both. We can do this discrete gamma. We talked about uh, last time, right? We have different, you know, both different rates for different things. Um, we'll pull from multiple rates with the same characters. Right. So we talked about that in the past. Could do a mixture model. That's what does this mean? So <coughs> I could apply you know, this to this as well as this to that, or this to that as well as this to that. Okay. And basically it's like gamma, um, but rather than doing just rates changing, you do all the, all the models changing. All the parameters in the model change. Okay, so we would probably do data given the rates and time, the rates and tree, right? It is you know, this, we do it over all the data. Right? We do the same thing, we do it over multiple different rates and features and add them up. Okay, and you can go wait for that. And so, hey, let me have something like this where they have. GTR matrix, two different GTR matrices, try running it, and find that you know, generic one is better for the G1, generic you know, two is better for G2. Okay? Um, so we can all sort of naturally pick that. Okay? <coughs> we can do branched heterogeneity. Right? So I can say, you know, I think Woody wants a different rate than Gracious wants. And I can do a priori assignment for this. I can say, okay, I have this Woody equations idea, and you paint branches with parameters, or I can do it post hoc, and I can, during my analysis, try different paintings and say, okay, let's try well, this painting of red and blue, then we try a different painting of red and blue. Okay, and it's both approaches. Um, and <coughs> people are sort of fighting over that now. So some people think that you can always do a priori painting, I do that way you have a hypothesis for testing, right? Do I think that Sunfish have a different rate than bass do, as we declare this, versus just sort of just fitting models willy nilly. Right? Some people though who think that what this is doing when you're trying to fit these models willy nilly is actually actually test hypotheses. So, for example, there was a paper published in Science on Anolis where they tried a whole bunch of different models that were OU type models, field like models, to see you know, do these do different do different islands have the same optimality criteria. Right? 
And they found that, yep, there's oftentimes this clumping where we see this trunk crowned optimum on, you know, Hispaniola, we also see in Cuba, which suggests convergence. But also this found unique model, unique optima as well. Okay, so it did both. So they're only testing hypothesis, but really doing this search over perimeter space. Okay. Uh, <coughs> We go through time periods. Right? Those ones we're doing much here. Where we pre and post KT models. Okay. Okay. Hence we have state of the field, right? So you can imagine combining all of these, right? So tree stretching, you can do it with both continuous traits and discrete traits. Heterogeneity, some sort of continuous, not much for discrete yet. Um, there's, there's a little bit, not very much. Um, both of them combined. Some here, not much here. And so if you have a study system where you care about your know, different rates of evolution of zygomorphy and exinomorphy, you know, uh, being like sort of bilaterally symmetrical and radially symmetrical flowers through time, you can imagine fitting a, a time slice model to that with a discrete trait method. Right? Um, by having a different rate matrix of different, part, different parts of the tree. Right? You can see how you would do that. But people haven't done that much yet. So you can see once you don't understand like the back of the idea of the basic ingredients, you can understand those ingredients to figure out how you can get out these questions. Any other questions about this? One thing I haven't talked about yet is you know Bayes versus likelihood for here. Okay. And you can do both. And people do do both kinds of both kinds of approaches in this area. Um, what you choose is sort of up to you. It could be based on you know, the, only, the only software is Bayesian, in which case it's your Bayesian now, right? or you write your own software. Or if it's both, and you have to choose which one you like. So those of you who have, have empirical data sets, you can get empirical data sets soon. What sort of questions would you, would you be addressing with them in this sort of area? Two thirds of faculty build trees here, so which would not like one third. You'd have a tree somewhere. Why? Okay. What, what context? Or not Between you know, pollinators and plants, or right. okay, right? What else? Deep size of age? No. <laughs> I that was like example 21 in their paper, right? And so like at this point, they can get, get published nowhere. You want to look at the response of, you know, plants to invasive species, right? You might want to control, control for a correlation. And maybe this entire clade does badly with invasive species. It's not that, you know, having small leaves makes you have a problem. It's being or a casey has makes you have a problem. To control for it that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I believe I, and it's less pumped than you think, but I think it is like non zero pumping. Okay. It's something you could check out. Yeah. What would you expect? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Apparently, it might be also like what relatives are nearby. And so, there's measures for, for ecology of phylogenetic distinctiveness. You know, it's like ginkgo, this is weird singleton, in tree of life. There's nothing like it. Whereas oaks, yeah, it's not oaks. And so, you could imagine that the thing that's most apt to become invasive is something that's way off by itself. 
has no relatives to compete with. So you can for that too. Other folks. You live in trees. Yeah. You know, you see how many times it's all straight reconstruction. You see how many times you know rotten flesh odor has evolved. You see it's correlated with some sort of habitat, even area where it's cold, and so bees don't fly as well, but flies can still get around or something. Test for that. Good. Good. Other questions about this? Other ideas what you could do this with? Okay, I will see you on Wednesday. We could, we could do an exercise now in R, but I think the course was some sort of dead enough for us to go. If you want to, though, we can. If you don't want to? You're all dead tonight. All right, go. <laughs>